Barcarolis Foundations of Psychiatric Mental Health Nursing, 8th edition, Chapter 2, Theories and Therapies, Key Terms and Concepts, Automatic Thoughts, Behavioral Therapy, Biofeedback, Classical Conditioning, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, or CBT, Cognitive Distortions, Conditioning, Conscious, Countertransference, Defense Mechanisms, Ego, Extinction, Id, Interpersonal Theory, Negative reinforcement, operant conditioning, positive reinforcement, preconscious, psychodynamic theory, punishment, reinforcement, superego, systematic desensitization, transference, unconscious. Every professional discipline from math and science to philosophy and psychology bases its work and beliefs on theories. Most of these theories can be best described as explanations, hypotheses, or hunches, rather than testable facts. The word theory may conjure up some dry conceptual images. You may vaguely recall the physicist's theory of relativity or the geologist's plate tectonics. Compared with most other theories, however, psychological theories are filled with familiar concepts and terms. Psychological theories have filtered their ways into parts of mainstream thinking and speech. For example, advertisers use the behaviorist trick of linking a seductive woman to the utilitarian minivan. And who has not attributed language mistakes to subconscious motivation. As the fictional king greets his queen, good morning, my beheaded, I mean my beloved, we comprehend the Freudian slip. Dealing with other people is one of the most universally anxiety-provoking activities, and psychological theories provide plausible explanations for perplexing behavior. Maybe the guy at the front desk who never greets you in the morning does not really despise you. Maybe he has an inferiority complex because his mother was cold and his father was absent from the home. This chapter will provide you with snapshots of some of the most influential psychological theories. It also gives you an overview of the treatments or therapies that the theories inspired. We will also address the contributions that the theories have made to the practice of psychiatric mental health nursing. Psychoanalytic Theories and Therapies Psychoanalytic Theory Sigmund Freud, 1856 to 1839, an Austrian neurologist, revolutionized thinking about mental health disorders. He introduced a groundbreaking theory of personality structure, levels of awareness, anxiety, the role of defense mechanisms, and the stages of psychosexual development. Originally, he was searching for biological treatments for psychological disturbances and even experimented with using cocaine as medication. He soon abandoned this physiological approach and focused on psychological treatments. Freud came to believe that the vast majority of mental disorders resulted from unresolved issues that originated in childhood. Levels of Awareness Freud believed that there were three levels of psychological awareness in operation. He used the image of an iceberg to describe these levels of awareness, figure 2.1. Conscious, the conscious part of the mind is the tip of the iceberg. It contains all the material a person is aware of at any one time, including perceptions, memories, thoughts, fantasies, and feelings. Preconscious. Just below the surface of awareness is the preconscious, which contains material that can be retrieved rather than easily, rather easily through conscious effort. Unconscious. The unconscious includes all repressed memories, passions, and unacceptable urges lying deep below the surface. Memories and emotions associated with trauma may be stored in the unconscious because the individual finds it too painful to deal with them. The unconscious exerts a powerful yet unseen effect on the conscious thoughts and feelings of the individual. The individual is usually unable to retrieve unconscious material without the assistance of a trained therapist. Personality Structure Freud, 1960, delineated three major and distinct but interactive systems of the personality. The id, the ego, and the superego. Id. At birth, we are all id. The id is totally unconscious and impulsive. It is the source of all drives, instincts, reflexes, and needs. The id cannot tolerate frustration and seeks to discharge tension and return to a more comfortable level of energy. The id lacks the ability to problem solve and is illogical. A hungry, screaming infant is the perfect example of id. Ego. Within the first few years of life, as a child begins to interact with others, the ego develops. The ego resides in the conscious, preconscious, and unconscious levels of awareness. The problem solver and reality tester, the ego attempts to navigate the outside world. It is able to differentiate subjective experiences, memory images, and objective reality. The ego follows the reality principle, which says to the id, 
you have to delay gratification for right now, then sets a course of action. For example, a hungry man feels tension arising from the id that wants to be fed. His ego allows him not only to think about his hunger, but also to plan where he can eat and seek that destination. This process is known as reality testing because the individual is factoring in reality to implement a plan to decrease tension. Superego. The superego, which develops between the ages of three and five, represents the moral component of personality. The superego resides in the conscious, preconscious, and unconscious levels of awareness. The superego consists of the conscience, all the should nots internalized from parents and society, and the ego ideal, all the shoulds internalized from parents and society. When behavior falls short of the ideal, the superego may induce guilt. Likewise, when behavior is ideal, the superego may allow a sense of pride. In a mature and well-adjusted individual, the three systems of the personality, the id, the ego, and the superego, work together as a team under the administrative leadership of the ego. If the id is too powerful, the person will lack control over impulses. If the superego is too powerful, the person may be self-critical and suffering from feelings of inferiority. Defense Mechanisms and Anxiety Freud, 1969, believed that anxiety is an inevitable part of living. The environment in which we live presents dangers and insecurities, threats and satisfactions. It can produce pain and increase tension or produce pleasure and decrease tension. The ego develops defenses, or defense mechanisms, to ward off anxiety by preventing conscious awareness of the threatening feelings. Defense mechanisms share two common features. One, they all, except suppression, operate on an unconscious level. And two, they deny, falsify, or distort reality to make it less threatening. Although we cannot survive without defense mechanisms, it is possible for our defense mechanism to distort reality to such a degree that we experience difficulty with healthy adjustment and personal growth. Chapter 15 provides a full list and description of defense mechanisms. Psychosexual Stages of Development Freud believed that human development proceeds through five stages from infancy to childhood. He believed that experiences during the first five years determined an individual's lifetime adjustment pattern and personality traits. By the time a child enters school, subsequent growth consists of elaborating on this basic structure. Freud's psychosexual stages of development are in Table 2.1. Psychoanalytic Therapy Classical psychoanalysis, as developed by Sigmund Freud, is seldom used today. Freud's premise that early intrapsychic conflict as the cause for all mental illness is no longer widely thought to be valid. Such therapy requires an unrealistically lengthy period of treatment, i.e. three to five times a week for many years, making it prohibitively expensive and uncovered by insurance. The purpose of these sessions is to uncover unconscious conflicts, free association, dream and fantasy analysis, defense mechanism recognition, and interpretation are tools used by the analyst. Two concepts from classic psychoanalysis that are important for nurses to know are transference and countertransference. Transference refers to unconscious feelings that the patient has toward a healthcare worker that were originally felt in childhood for a significant other. The patient may say something like, you remind me exactly of my sister. The transference may be positive, affectionate, or negative, hostile. Psychoanalysis actually encourages transference as a way to understand original relationships. Such exploration helps the patient to better understand certain feelings and behaviors. Countertransference refers to unconscious feelings that the healthcare worker has towards the patient. For instance, if the patient reminds you of someone you do not like, you may unconsciously react as if the patient were that individual. Strong negative or positive feelings towards the patient could be a red flag for countertransference. Such responses underscore the importance of maintaining self-awareness and seeking supervisory guidance as therapeutic relationship progresses. Chapter 8 talks more about countertransference and the nurse-patient relationship. Psychodynamic theory. Psychodynamic theory follows the psychoanalytic model by using many of the tools of psychoanalysis, such as free association, dream analysis, transference, and countertransference. However, the therapist has increased involvement and interacts with the patient more freely than in traditional psychoanalysis. The therapy is oriented toward the here and now and makes less of an attempt to reconstruct the developmental origins of conflicts. Psychodynamic therapy tends to last longer than other common therapeutic modalities and may extend for more than 20 sessions 
which insurance companies often reject. The best candidates for psychodynamic therapy are relatively healthy and well-functioning individuals, sometimes referred to as the worried well, who have a clear idea of difficulty and are intelligent, psychologically minded, and well-motivated for change. Patients with psychosis, severe depression, borderline personality disorders, and severe character disorders are not appropriate candidates for this type of treatment. At the start of treatment, the patient and therapist agree on what the focus will be and concentrate their work on that focus. Sessions are held weekly, and the total number of sessions to be held is determined at the outset of therapy. There is a rapid back-and-forth pattern between patient and therapist, with both participating actively. The therapist intervenes constantly to keep the therapy on track, either by redirecting the patient's attention or by interpreting deviations from the focus to the patient. Implications of Psychoanalytic Theory for Nursing Practice Freud's theory offers a comprehensive explanation of complex human processes. It emphasizes the importance of childhood experiences on personality development. Nurses can be sources of support and education for both parents and children to promote a healthy emotional environment. Freud's theory of the unconscious mind is particularly valuable as a baseline for considering the complexity of human behavior. By considering conscious and unconscious influences, a nurse can identify and begin to think about the root cause of patient suffering. Freud emphasized the importance of individual talk sessions characterized by attentive listening with a focus on underlying themes as an important tool of healing in psychiatric care. Interpersonal Theories and Therapies Interpersonal Theory Harry Stack Sullivan, 1892-1949, an American-born psychi psychiatrist, developed a model for understanding psychiatric alterations that focused on interpersonal problems. Sullivan, 1953, believed that human beings are driven by the need for interaction. Indeed, he viewed loneliness as the most painful human condition. He emphasized the early relationship with the primary parenting figure or significant other, a term he coined, as crucial for personality development. According to Sullivan, the purpose of all behavior is to get needs met through interpersonal interactions and to reduce or avoid anxiety. He defined anxiety as any painful feeling or emotion that arises from social insecurity or prevents biological needs from being satisfied. Sullivan coined the term security operations to describe measures the individual employs to reduce anxiety and enhance security. Collectively, all of the security operations an individual used to defend against anxiety and ensure self-esteem make up self-system. Interpersonal theory. Interpersonal theory is an effective short-term therapy. The assumption is that psychiatric disorders are influenced by interpersonal interactions and the social context. The goal of interpersonal theory is to reduce or eliminate psychiatric symptoms, particularly depression, by improving interpersonal functioning and satisfaction with social relationships. Interpersonal theory has proven successful in the treatment of depression. Treatment is based on the notion that disturbances in important interpersonal relationships or, or a deficit in one's capacity to form those relationships can play a role in initiating or maintaining clinical depression. In interpersonal therapy, the therapist identifies the nature of the problem to be resolved and then selects strategies consistent with the problem area. Three types of problems in particular respond well to interpersonal therapy. One, grief and loss, complicated bereavement after death, divorce, or other loss. Two, interpersonal disputes, conflicts with a significant other. Three, role transition, problematic change in life status or social or vocational role. Implications of interpersonal theory to nursing. Peplau's theory of interpersonal relationships. Hildegard Peplau, influenced by the work of Sullivan and learning theory, developed the first systematic theoretical framework for psychiatric nursing in her groundbreaking work, Interpersonal Relationships in Nursing. Peplau not only established the foundation for the professional practice of psychiatric nursing, but also continued to enrich psychiatric nursing theory and work from the advancement of nursing practice throughout her career. Peplau was the first nurse to identify psychiatric mental health nursing both as an essential element of general nursing 
and as a specialty area that embraces specific governing principles. She was also the first nurse theorist to describe the nurse-patient relationship as the foundation of nursing practice. She also shifted the focus from what nurses do to patients to what nurses do with patients. Her theory is mainly concerned with the processes by which the nurse helps patients make positive changes in their health care status and well-being. She believed that illness offered a unique opportunity for experimental learning, personal growth, and improved coping strategies. Psychiatric nurses play a central role in facilitating this growth. Peplau proposed an approach in which nurses are both participants and observers in therapeutic conversations. She believed it was essential for nurses to observe the behavior not only of the patient, but also of themselves. This self-awareness on the part of the nurse is essential in keeping the focus on the patient and in keeping the social and personal needs of the nurse out of the nurse-patient conversation. Perhaps Peplau's most universal contribution to the everyday practice of psychiatric mental health nursing is her application of Sullivan's theory of anxiety to nursing practice. She described the effects of different levels of anxiety, mild, moderate, severe, and panic, on perception and learning. She promoted interventions to lower anxiety with the aim of improving patients' abilities to think and function at more satisfactory levels. Chapter 15 presents more of the application of Peplau's theory of anxiety and interventions. Table 2.2 lists selected nursing theorists and summarizes their major contributions and the impact of these contributions on psychiatric mental health nursing. Behavioral Theories and Therapies Behavioral theories developed as a protest response to Freud's assumption that a person's destiny was carved in stone at a very early age. Behaviors have no concern with inner conflicts and argue that personality simply consists of learned behaviors. Consequently, personality becomes synonymous with behavior. If behavior changes, so does the personality. Behaviorists believe that behavior can be influenced through a process referred to conditioning. Conditioning involves pairing a behavior with a condition that reinforces or diminishes the behavior's occurrence. Classical Conditioning Theory Ivan Pavlov, 1849-1936, was a Russian physiologist. He won a Nobel Prize for his outstanding contributions to the physiology of digestion, which he studied through his well-known experiments with dogs. An incidental observation of the dogs Pavlov noticed that the dogs were able to anticipate when food would be forthcoming and would begin to salivate even before actually tasting the meat. Pavlov formalized his observations of behaviors in dogs in a theory of classical conditioning. Pavlov, 1928, found that when a neutral stimulus, a bell, was repeatedly paired with another stimulus, food, that triggered salivation, eventually the sound of the bell alone could elicit salivation in the dogs. A human example of this response is a boy becoming ill after eating spoiled coleslaw at a picnic. Later in life, he feels nauseated whenever he smells coleslaw. It is important to recognize that classical conditioned responses are involuntary, not under conscious personal control, and are not spontaneous choices. Behavioral Theory John B. Watson was an American psychologist who rejected the unconscious motivation of psychoanalysis for being too subjective. He developed a school of thought referred to as behaviorism, which he believed was more objective or measurable. Watson, 1919, contended that personality traits and responses, adaptive and maladaptive, were socially learned through classical conditioning. In a famous but terrible experiment, Watson stood behind little Albert, a, a nine-month-old who liked animals, and made a loud noise with a hammer every time the infant reached for a white rat. After this experiment, little Albert became terrified at the sight of white fur or hair, even in the absence of a loud noise. Wasson concluded that controlling the environment could mold behavior and that anyone could be trained to be anything, from a beggar man to a merchant. Operant Conditioning Theory B.F. Skinner, 1904-1990, represented the second wave of behavioral theorists. Skinner, 1987, researched operant conditioning, a method of learning that occurs through rewards and punishment for voluntary behavior. 
Behavioral responses are elicited through reinforcement, which causes the behavior to occur more frequently. Skinner conducted experiments with laboratory animals in what is now referred to as a Skinner box. The contents of this box include a lever and an electric grid. To cause behavior more frequently, Skinner used two methods. When a hungry rest, rat pressed the lever, it would receive a food pellet. He learned to go straight to the lever for food. This is positive reinforcement of the behavior. Another rat was placed in the cage with an electrical charge on the grid under the, his feet. If he accidentally pressed the lever, the charge would turn off. He learned to go straight to the lever to eliminate the shock. This removal of an objectionable or averse stimulus is negative reinforcement. Other techniques can cause behavior to occur less frequently. One technique is an unpleasant consequence or punishment. Driving too fast may result in a speeding ticket, which in mature and healthy individuals decreases the chances that speeding will occur. Absence of reinforcement or extinction also decreases behavior by withholding a reward that has become habitual. If a person tells a joke and no one laughs, for example, the person is less apt to tell jokes because his joke telling behavior is not being reinforced. Teachers employ this strategy in the classroom when they ignore acting out behavior that had been previously been rewarded by more attention. Behavioral therapy. Behavioral therapy is based on the assumption that changes in maladaptive behavior can occur, can occur without insight into the underlying cause. This approach works best when it is directed at specific problems and the goals are well defined. Behavioral therapy is effective in treating people with phobias, alcoholism, schizophrenia, and many other conditions. Four types of behavioral therapy are discussed here. Modeling, operant condition, systematic desensitization, and aversion therapy. Modeling. In modeling, the therapist provides a role model for specific identified behaviors, and the patient learns through imitation. The therapist may do the modeling, provide another person to model the behaviors, or present a video for the purpose. Bandura, Blanchard, and Ritter, 1969, were able to help people reduce their phobias about non-poisonous snakes. They did this by having them first view close-ups of filmed encounters between people and snakes that resulted in successful outcomes. Afterward, they viewed live encounters between people and snakes that also had successful outcomes. In a similar fashion, some behavior therapists use role-playing in the consulting room. They demonstrate patterns of behavior that might prove more effective than those usually engaged in and then have the patients practice these new behaviors. For example, a student who does not know how to ask a professor for an extension on a term paper would watch the therapist portray a potentially effective way of making the request. The clinician would then help the student practice a new skill in a similar role-playing situation. Operant conditioning. Operant conditioning is the basis for behavior modification and uses positive reinforcement to increase desired behaviors. For example, when desired goals are achieved or behaviors are performed, patients might be rewarded with tokens. These tokens can be exchanged for food, small luxuries, or privileges. This reward system is known as a token economy. Operant conditioning has been useful in improving the verbal behaviors of mute, autistic, and developmentally disabled children. In patients with severe and persistent mental illness, behavior modification has helped increase levels of self-care, social behavior, group participation, and more. You may find this is a useful technique as you proceed through your clinical rotations. A familiar case in point of positive reinforcement is the mother who takes her preschooler along to the grocery store, and the child starts acting out, demanding candy, nagging, crying, and yelling. Here are examples of three ways a child's behavior can be reinforced. One, the mother gives the child candy. Result, the child continues to use this behavior. This is positive reinforcement of negative behavior. Two, the mother scolds the child. Result, acting out may continue because the child gets what he really wants, attention. This positively rewards negative behavior. Three, the mother ignores the acting out but gives attention to the child when he is acting appropriately. Result, the child gets a positive reward for appropriate behavior. Systematic desensitization is another form of behavior modification therapy that involves the development of behavior tasks customized to the patient's specific fears. 
These tasks are presented to the patient while using learned relaxation techniques. The process involves four steps. One, the patient's fear is broken down into its components by exploring the particular stimulus cues to which the patient reacts. For example, certain situations may precipitate a phobic reaction, whereas others do not. Crowds of parties may be problematic, whereas similar numbers of people in other settings do not cause the same distress. Two, the patient is exposed to the fear little by little. For example, a patient who has a fear of flying is introduced to short periods of visual presentations of flying, first with still pictures, then with videos, and finally in a busy airport. The situations are confronted while the patient is in a relaxed state. Gradually, over a period of time, exposure is increased until anxiety about or fear of the object or situation has ceased. 3. The patient is instructed in how to design a hierarchy of fears. For fear of flying, the patient might develop a set of statements representing the stages of a flight. Order those statements from the most fearful to the least fearful and use relaxation techniques to reach a state of relaxation as they progress through the list. Four, the patient practices these techniques every day. Aversion therapy. Aversion therapy is used to treat behaviors such as alcoholism, paraphilic disorders, shoplifting, violent and aggressive behavior, and self-mutilation. Aversion therapy is the pairing of a negative stimulus with a specific target behavior, thereby suppressing the behavior. This treatment may be used when other less drastic measures have failed to produce the desired effects. Simple examples of extinguishing undesirable behavior through aversion therapy include painting foul-tasting substances onto the fingernails of nail biters or the thumbs of thumb suckers. Other examples of aversion stimuli are chemicals that induce nausea and vomiting, unpleasant odors, unpleasant verbal stimuli, e.g. descriptions of disturbing scenes, costs or fines in a token economy, and denial of positive reinforcement, e.g. isolation. Before initiating any aversive protocol, the therapist treatment team or society must answer the following questions. Is this therapy in the best interest of the patient? Does, it use, does its use violate the patient's rights? Is it in the best interest of society? If the therapist believes aversion therapy as the most appropriate treatment, ongoing supervision, support, and evaluation of those administering it must occur. Biofeedback is also a form of behavioral therapy and is successfully used today, especially for controlling the body's phys physiological response to stress and anxiety. Chapter 10 discusses biofeedback in further detail. Implications of behavioral theory to nursing. Behavior and health are inextricably linked. Consider the toll that such behaviors as smoking, overeating, alcohol, and substance abuse problems and inactivity take on the body and mind. The behavioral model produces a concrete method for modifying or replacing undesirable behaviors. An example of nurse teaching a behavioral technique is smoking cessation. For example, a therapist teaches patients to modify routines to reduce smoking cues, such as avoiding bars. Nurses may work in units based on behavioral principles, particularly with children and adolescents. Token economies represent extensions of Skinner's thoughts on learning. In a token economy, patients' positive behaviors are reinforced with tokens. These tokens may be small plastic discs, check marks, or coins with no real value that can be used in exchange for materials e.g. candy, gum, or books, or services, e.g. phone calls, time off the unit, or recognition. Cognitive theories and therapies. While behavior is focused on increasing, decreasing, or eliminating measurable behaviors, they did not focus on the thoughts or cognitions that were involved in these behaviors. Rather than thinking of people as passive recipients of environmental conditioning, cognitive theorists proposed that there is a dynamic interplay between individuals and the environment. These theorists believed that thoughts come before feelings and actions, and thoughts about the world and our place in it are based on our own unique perspectives, which may or may not be based on reality. 
This section presents two of the most influential theorists and their therapies. Rational Emotive Therapy Albert Ellis, 1913 to 2007, developed Rational Emotive Therapy in 1955. The aim of Rational Emotive Therapy is to remove core irrational beliefs by helping people recognize thoughts that are not accurate, sensible, or useful. These thoughts tend to take the forms of shoulds, e.g., I should always be polite, or oughts, e.g., I ought to consistently win my tennis games, and musts, e.g., I must be thin. Alice described negative thinking as simple ABC process. A stands for the activating event, B stands for the beliefs about the event, and C stands for emotional consequence of the, as a result of the event. Perception influences all thoughts, which in turn influence our behaviors. It often boils down to the simple notion of perceiving the glass as half full or half empty. For example, imagine you have just received an inv invitation to a birthday party, activating event. You think, I hate parties. Now I have to go hang out with people who don't like me instead of watching my favorite television shows. They probably just invited me to get a gift. Beliefs. You will probably be miserable, emotional consequence, if you go. On the other hand, you may think, I love parties. This will be a great chance to meet new people, and it will be fun to shop for the perfect gift. Beliefs. You could have a delightful time. Emotional consequence. Although Ellis recognized the role of past experiences on current beliefs, the focus of rational emotive therapy is on present attitudes, painful feelings, and dysfunctional behaviors. If our beliefs are negative and self-deprecating, we are more susceptible to depression and anxiety. Ellis noted that while we cannot change the past, we can change the way we are now. He was pragmatic in his approach to mental illness and colorful in his therapeutic advice. It's too darn bad you panic, but you don't die from it. Get them over the panic about panic, you may find the panic disappears. Cognitive Behavioral Therapy Aaron T. Beck was originally trained in psychoanalysis. He noticed that people with depression thought differently than people who were not depressed. They had stereotypical patterns of negative and self-critical thinking that seemed to distort their ability to think and process information. To challenge these negative patterns, he developed CBT, which is based on both cognitive psychology and behavioral ther theory. Beck's method, the basis for CBT, is an active, directive, time-limited, structured approach. This evidence-based therapy is used to treat a variety of psychiatric disorders such as depression, anxiety, phobias, and pain. It is based on the underlying theoretical principle that feelings and behaviors are largely determined by the way people think about the world and their place in it. Their cognitions, verbal or pictorial events, and their streams of consciousness are based on attitudes or assumptions developed from previous experiences. These cognitions may be fairly accurate or distorted. According to Beck, people have schemas, or unique assumptions about themselves, others, and the world in general. For example, a man has a schema, the only person I can trust is myself, he will have expectations that everyone else has questionable motives, are dishonest, and will eventually hurt him. Other negative schemas include incompetence, abandonment, evilness, and vulnerability. People are typically not aware of such cognitive biases. Rapid, unthinking responses based on schemas are known as automatic thoughts. These responses are particularly intense and frequent in psychiatric disorders such as depression and anxiety. Often automatic thoughts or cognitive distortions are irrational and lead to false assumptions and misinterpretations. For example, a woman interprets all experiences in terms of whether she is competent and adequate. Thinking may be dominated by the cognitive distortion, unless I do everything perfectly, I'm a failure. Consequently, the person reacts to situations in terms of adequacy, even when the situations are unrelated to whether she is personally competent. Table 2.3 describes common cognitive distortions. Therapeutic techniques are designed to identify reality tests and correct distorted conceptualizations and the dysfunctional beliefs underlying them. Patients are taught to challenge their own negative thinking and substitute it with positive, rational thoughts. They learn to recognize when thinking is based on distortions and misconceptions. Homework assignments play an important role in CBT. 
A particularly useful technique is the use of a four column format to record the precipitating event or situation, the resulting automatic thought, and the preceding feeling and behavior. Finally, a challenge to the negative thoughts based on rational evidence and thinking is listed in the last column. The following is an example of the type of analysis done by a patient receiving CBT. 24-year-old nurse who was recently discharged from the hospital for severe depression presented this record. Event. While at a party, Corey asked me, how is it going? A few days after, I was discharged from the hospital. Feeling. Anxious. Cognitions. Corey thinks I'm crazy. I must really look bad for him to be concerned. Other possible interpretations. He really cares about me. He noticed that I look better than before I went into the hospital and wants to know if I feel better too. Table 2.4 compares and contrasts psychodynamic, interpersonal, cognitive behavioral, and behavioral therapies. Implications of cognitive theories for nursing. Recognizing the interplay between events, negative thinking, and negative responses can be beneficial from both a patient care standpoint and a personal one. As a supportive therapeutic measure, helping the patient identify negative thought patterns is a worthwhile intervention. Workbooks are available to aid in the process of identifying cognitive distortions. A cognitive approach can also help nurses understand their own responses to a variety of difficult situations. One example might be the anxiety that some students feel regarding the psychiatric nursing clinical rotation. Students may overgeneralize, all psychiatric patients are dangerous, or personalize, my patient doesn't seem to be better, I'm probably not doing him any good, the situation. The key to effectively using this approach in clinical situations is to challenge the negative thoughts not based on facts and then replace them with more realistic appraisals. Humanistic theories. In the 1950s, humanistic theories arose as a protest against both the behavioral and psychoanalytic schools, which were thought to be pessimistic, deterministic, and dehumanizing. Humanistic theories focus on human potential and free will to choose life patterns supportive of a personal growth. Humanistic frameworks emphasize a person's capacity for self-actualization. This approach fo focuses on understanding the patient's perspective as he or she subjectively experiences it. There are a number of humanistic theorists, and this text will explore Abraham Maslow and his theory of self-actualization. Theory of Human Motivation Abraham Maslow, 1908-1970, is considered the father of humanistic psychology. He criticized other therapies for focusing too intensely on human frailties and not enough on its strengths. Maslow contended that the focus of psychology must go beyond experiences of hate, pain, misery, guilt, and conflict to include love, compassion, happiness, exhilaration, and well-being. Hierarchy of Needs Maslow believed that human beings are motivated by unmet needs. Maslow, 1968, focused on human need fulfillment, which he categorized into six incremental stages, beginning with physiological survival needs and ending with self-transcendent needs. The hierarchy of needs is conceptualized as a pyramid, with the strongest, most fundamental needs placed on the lower levels. The higher levels, the more distinctly human needs, occupy the top sections of the pyramid. When lower level needs are met, higher needs are able to emerge. Physiological needs. The most basic needs are the physiological drives, needing food, oxygen, water, sleep, sex, and a constant body temperature. If all needs were deprived, this level would take priority over the rest. Safety needs. Once phys physiological needs are met, safety needs emerge. They include security, protection, freedom from fear, anxiety, and chaos, the need for law, order, and limits. Adults in a stable society usually feel safe, but they may feel threatened by debt, job insecurity, or lack of insurance. It is during times of crisis such as war, disasters, assaults, and social breakdown when safety needs take precedence. Children who are more vulnerable and dependent respond far more readily and intensely to safety threats. Belonging and love needs. People have a need for intimate relationships, 
love, affection, and belonging, and will seek to overcome feelings of loneliness and alienation. Maslow stresses the importance of having a family and a home and being part of identifiable groups. Esteem needs. People need to have a high self-regard and have it reflected to them from others. If self-esteem needs are met, they feel confident, valued, and valuable. When self-esteem is compromised, they feel inferior, worthless, and helpless. Self-actualization. Human beings are preset to strive to be everything they are capable of becoming. Maslow said, what a man can be, he must be. What people are capable of becoming is highly individual. An artist must paint, a writer must write, and a healer must heal. The drive to satisfy this need is felt as a sort of restlessness, a sense that something is missing. It is up to each person to choose a path that will bring about inner peace and fulfillment. Although Maslow's early work included only five levels of needs, he later took into account two additional factors. One, cognitive needs, the desire to know and understand, and two, aesthetic needs. He describes the acquisition of knowledge, our first priority, and the need to understand, our second priority, as being hardwired and essential. The aesthetic need for beauty and symmetry is universal. You may be interested to know that Maslow, 1970, developed his theory by investigating people whom he believed were self-actualized. Among these people were historical figures such as Abraham Lincoln, Thomas Jefferson, Harriet Tubman, Walt Whitman, Ludwig van Beethoven, William James, and Franklin D. Roosevelt. Other people he investigated were living at the time of his studies. They included Albert Einstein, Eleanor Roosevelt, and Albert Schweitzer. Box 2.1 identifies basic personality characteristics that distinguish, distinguish self-actualizing people. Implications of Motivation Theory for Nursing The value of Maslow's model in nursing practice is twofold. First, an emphasis on human potential and the patient's strength is key to successful nurse-patient relationships. Second, the model helps establish what is most important in the sequencing of nursing actions. For example, to collect any but the most essential information when a patient is struggling with drug withdrawal may be dangerous. Following Maslow's model as a way of prioritizing actions, the nurse meets the patient's physiological need for stable vital signs and pain relief before collecting general information for a nursing database. Biological theories and therapies. Biological model. Biological model or medical model of mental illness assumes that abnormal behavior is the result of a physical problem. It focuses on neurological, chemical, biological, and genetic issues. Adherents of this dominant model seek to understand how the body and brain interact to create emotions, memories, and perceptual experiences. The biological model locates the illness or disease in the body, usually in the limbic system of the brain and the synapse receptor sites of the central nervous system, and targets the site of illness using physical interventions such as drugs, diet, and surgery. The recognition that psychiatric illnesses are as physical in origin as diabetes and coronary heart disease serves to decrease the stigma surrounding them. Just as someone with diabetes or heart disease cannot be held responsible for being ill, patients with schizophrenia or bipolar or affective disorder are no more to blame. Biological therapies, psychopharmacology therapy. In 1950, a French drug firm synthesized chlorpromazine, a powerful antipsychotic medication and psychiatry experienced a revolution. The advent of psychopharmacology, the use of medications to treat mental illness, presented a strong alternative to psychological approach for mental illness. The dramatic experience of observing patients freed from the bondage of psychosis and mania by powerful drugs such as chlorpram chlorpromazine and lithium left witnesses convinced of the critical role of the brain in psychiatric illness. Since the discovery of chlorpromazine, later sold under the trade name Thorazine, many other medications have proven effective in controlling psychosis, mania, depression, and anxiety. These medications greatly reduce the need for hospitalization and dramatically improve the lives of people suffering from psychiatric difficulties. Today, psychoactive medications exert differential effects on different neurotransmitters 
and help restore brain function, allowing patients with mental illness to continue living productive lives with greater satisfaction and far less emotional pain. Brain Stimulation Therapies In addition to psychotherapy and psychopharmacology, a treatment for mental illness are the brain stimulation therapies. The oldest of these therapies is electroconvulsive therapy, or ECT. All of these methods include focused electrical stimulation of the brain. In addition to treating psychiatric disorders, they also treat traditional neurological disorders, such as Parkinson's disease, epilepsy, and pain conditions. Table 2.5 provides a summary of food and drug administration approved brain stimulation treatments and their use. Implications of the biological model for nursing. Historically, psychiatric mental health nurses always have attended to the physical needs of psychiatric patients. Nurses administer medications. They also monitor sleep, activity, nutrition, hydration, elimination, and other functions. Nurses are responsible for preparing patients for somatic therapies such as ECT. Physical needs and physical care in psychiatric nursing are provided as part of a holistic approach to healthcare. Basic nursing strategies, such as focusing on the qualities of a therapeutic relationship, understanding the patient's perspective, and communicating in a way that facilitates the patient's recovery, takes place alongside physical care. Developmental theories. Cognitive development. Jean Piaget, 1896-1980, was a Swiss psychologist and researcher. While working at a boys' school run by Alfred Bennett, developer of the Bennett Intelligence Test, Piaget helped to score these tests. He became fascinated by the fact that young children consistently gave wrong answers on intelligence tests, wrong answers that revealed a discernible pattern of cognitive processing that was different from that of older children and adults. He concluded that cognitive development is a dynamic progression from primitive awareness and simple reflexes to complex thought and responses. Our mental representations of the world, or schemata, depend on the cognitive stage we have reached. Sensory motor stage, birth to two years, begins with basic reflexes and culminates with purposeful movement, spatial abilities, and hand-eye coordination. Physical interaction with the environment provides the child with a basic understanding of the world. By about nine months, object permanence is achieved and the child can conceptualize objects that are no longer visible. This explains the delight of the game of peekaboo as an emerging skill as the child begins to anticipate the face hidden behind the hands. Pre-operational stage, two to seven years. Operations is a term used to describe thinking about objects. Children are not yet able to think abstractly or generalize qualities in the absence of specific objects but rather think in a concrete fashion. Egocentric thinking is demonstrated through a tendency to expect others to view the world as they do. They are also unable to conserve mass, volume, or number. An example of this inability is thinking that a tall, thin glass holds more, than a, holds more liquid than a short, wide glass. Concrete operational stage, 7 to 11 years. Logical thought appears in abstract problem solving as possible. A child is able to see a situation from another's point of view and can take into account a variety of solutions to a problem. Conservation is possible. For example, two small cups holding an amount of liquid equal to a tall glass. They are able to classify based on discrete characteristics, order objects in a pattern, and understand the concept of reversibility. Formal operational stage, 11 years to adulthood. Conceptual reasoning commences at approximately the same time as does puberty. This stage, the child's basic abilities to think abstractly and problem solve mirror those of an adult. Theory of psychosocial development. Eric Erickson, 1902 to 1994, an American psychoanalyst, began as a follower of Freud. Erickson, 1963, came to believe that Freudian theory was, a, was restrictive and negative in its approach. He also stressed that more than the limited mother-child-father triangle influences an individual's development. He emphasized the role of culture and society on personality development. 
According to Erickson, personality was not set in stone at age five, as Freud suggested, but continued to evolve throughout the lifespan. Erickson described development as occurring in eight predetermined and consecutive life stages, psychosocial crises, each of which results in a positive or negative outcome. The successful or unsuccessful completion of each stage will affect the individual's progression to the next, Table 2.6. For example, Eric's crisis of industry versus inferiority occurs from the ages of 7 to 12. During this stage, the child's task is to gain a sense of personal abilities and competence and to expand relationships beyond the immediate family to include peers. The attainment of this task, industry, brings with it the virtue of confidence. A child who fails to navigate this stage successfully is unable to ma master age-appropriate tasks, cannot make a connection with peers, and will feel like a failure inferiority. Theory of Object Relations The theory of object relations was developed by interpersonal theorists who em emphasize past relationships in influencing a person's sense of self as well as the nature and quality of relationships in the present. The term object refers to another person, particularly a significant person. Margaret Maller 1895 to 1985, was a Hungarian-born child psychologist who worked with emotionally disturbed children. She developed a framework for studying how an infant transitions from complete self-absorption with an inability to separate from its mother to a physically and psychologically differentiated toddler. Mahler, 1975, believed that psychological problems were largely the result of disruption of this separation. During the first three years, the significant other, e.g. the mother, provides a secure base of support that promotes enough confidence for the child to separate. This is achieved by a balance of holding, emotionally and physically, the child enough for the child to feel safe while encouraging independence and natural exploration. Problems may arise in this process. The toddler leaves his or her mother on the park bench and wanders off to the sandbox. The child should be encouraged with smiles and reassurance. Go on, honey. It's safe to go away for a little. Then the mother needs to be reliably present when the toddler returns, thereby rewarding his or her efforts. Mahler notes that raising healthy children does not require that parents never make mistakes and that good enough parenting will promote successful separation individuation. Theories of Moral Development Stages of Moral Development Lawrence Kohlberg, 1927-1987, was an American psychologist whose work reflected and expanded on Piaget's by applying his theory of moral development, development which coincided with cognitive development. While visiting Israel, Kohlberg became convinced that children living in a kibbutz had advanced moral development, and he believed that the atmosphere of trust, respect, and self-governance nurtured this development. In the United States, he created schools or just communities that were grounded on these concepts. Based on interviews with youths, Kohlberg developed a theory of how people progressively develop a sense of morality. His theory provides a framework for understanding the progression from black and white thinking about right and wrong to complex, variable, and context-dependent decision-making process regarding the rightness of wrong or wrongness of action. Pre-conventional level. Stage 1. Obedience and punishment. The hallmarks of this stage are a focus on rules and on listening to authority. People at this stage believe that obedience is the method to avoid punishment. Stage 2. Individualism and exchange. Individuals become aware that not everyone thinks the way that they do and that different people see rules differently. If they or others decide to break the rules, they are risking punishment. Conventional level. Stage 3. Good Interpersonal Relationships Children begin to view rightness and wrongness as related to motivations, personality, or the goodness or badness of the person. Generally speaking, people should get along and have similar values. Stage 4. Maintaining the Social Order A rules are rules mindset returns. However, the reasoning behind it is not simply to avoid punishment, it is because the person has begun to adopt a broader view of society. Listening to authority maintains a social order. Bureaucracies and big government agencies 
often seem to operate with this tenet. Post-conventional level. Stage 5. Social contract and individual rights. People in stage 5 still believe that the social order is important, but the social order must be good. For example, if the social order is corrupt, then rules should be changed and it is the duty to protect the rights of others. Stage 6. Universal ethical principles. Actions should create justice for everyone involved. We are obliged to break unjust laws. Ethics of Care Theory Carol Gilligan, born 1936, is an American psychologist, ethicist, and feminist who inspired the normative ethics of care theory. She worked with Kohlberg, and he developed his theory of moral development and later criticized his work for being based on a sample of boys and men. Additionally, she believed that he used a scoring method that favored males' methods of reasoning, resulting in lower more development scores for girls as compared with boys. Based on Gilligan's critique, Kohlberg later revised his scoring methods, which resulted in greater similarity between girls' and boys' scores. Gilligan suggests that morality of care should replace Kohlberg's justice view of morality maintains that we should do what is right no matter the personal cost or the cost of those we love. Gilligan's care view emphasizes the importance of forming relationships, banding together, and putting the needs of those uh, for whom we care about above the needs of strangers. Gilligan asserts that a female approach to ethics has always been in existence, but has been trivialized. Like Kohlberg, Gilligan asserts that moral development progresses through three major divisions, pre-conventional, conventional, and post-conventional. These transitions are not di dictated by cognitive ability, but rather through personal development and changes in sense of self. Conclusion. This chapter introduced you to some of the historically significant theories and therapies widely used today and the theoretical implications for nursing care. Table 2.8 lists additional theorists whose contributions influence psychiatric mental health nursing. There are literally hundreds of therapies in use today. The Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration maintains a national registry of evidence-based practices and programs. New therapies are entered into the database all the time. Examples of therapies that were added in 2015 include Alcohol EDU for College and Internal Family Systems Therapy. The registry can be accessed at blah, 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 blah. You will be introduced to other therapeutic approaches later in this book. Crisis Intervention, Chapter 26, is an approach you will find useful not only in psychiatric mental health nursing, but also in other nursing specialties. This book will also discuss Group Therapy, Chapter 34, and Family Interventions, Chapter 35, which are appropriate for the basic level practitioner.